Welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. If you like this video, please let me know by subscribing to the channel or visiting my website to become a member for more exclusive content. Another healthy movement that came out of this patient safety endeavor has been the idea that sorry works. And what drives malpractice claims is your honesty with patients, not whether or not you make a mistake. And I found that to be true in my practice, that if you're very honest with people, they're incredibly forgiving. I remember ordering a CAT scan. I was busy. I was between operations. It ended up getting done on a wrong patient, similar name, done on the wrong patient. I don't know if I mixed up the names or the nurse made a clerical mistake in entering the order because we do a lot of verbal orders, you know, as attending physicians. And this patient was already angry at me. They had a pancreatic leak. They just were frustrated with their care. I think their expectations were unreasonable, but of course you got to be polite. So this guy was already pissed at me. I figure, great. He just got a CAT scan he didn't need. It's very obvious he didn't need it. He was recovering. Now he's going to sue me or something. I immediately hear about this. I run up to the patient's room and I say, look, sir, I want to tell you something. You got a CAT scan you did not need. It was not intended for you. I'm not going to sugarcoat it and say we wanted to make sure and look for something. It was a clerical mistake. I take full responsibility. I'm sorry. If you want the results, I haven't even seen it yet. I just heard about this and I wanted to tell you first. I'll get the results and share the results with you. This guy who had a pissed off look on his face as I walked into his room smiled and looked at me and said, Doc, thank you for being honest with me. I really appreciate that. And our bond grew. We, he developed trust in me. And I'm proud to report that guy and I are Facebook friends today because he never sued me. And people are hungry for honesty. We saw it during COVID. We see it with so many aspects of medicine. Let me share with you a counterpoint to that story. I'm not telling something that isn't already publicly known. So a very close friend of mine here in Austin, his name is Eddie Margain, a wonderful guy. And I've gotten to be very close with Eddie. And one night over dinner, we were talking about this and somehow he brought up the story of his wife, Lorena. At the time, I didn't know this, but of course, she's written a book about this. So again, nothing I'm saying here is is not already publicly known. Lorena was having some medical issues and had kind of the big workup. And sure enough, they found that she had a mass on her adrenal gland. So the adrenal gland for listeners is a small but incredibly important gland that sits on top of the kidney. So you have two kidneys and therefore you have two adrenal glands, one on top of each. The adrenal gland produces all sorts of relevant hormones, but certainly the ones that we think of the most would be cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine. And she had this tumor on her adrenal gland. And obviously the treatment for this is to have it removed. And you can live with one adrenal gland. So this is, you know, a relatively straightforward operation. So she had the operation. This was here in Austin. And In the weeks that followed, she went from bad to worse. She just felt horrible. She couldn't understand what was wrong. To make a long story short, she ended up eventually going back to see the doctor only to discover, Marty, that he had taken out the wrong adrenal gland. He had removed her healthy adrenal gland, and the one with the tumor was still there. So now they needed to go back and have that one removed, and so now she is a person who has no adrenal glands, which creates a lifelong challenge. You can't live without your adrenal gland, so now you are dependent on exogenous forms of glucocorticoids. The story gets even more difficult because there were more surgical complications and things like that. Lorena is about the sweetest person you'll ever meet, not a negative, vindictive bone in her body, and she only wanted one thing. It wasn't money. She just wanted an apology, and the surgeon wouldn't give it. <laughs> You hear these stories and you understand the reputation that the field of surgery can sometimes bring on itself. He had a million excuses. Egos. The arrogance, the hubris. He could not bring himself to apologize to this woman. And the lawyers don't help either because many times the hospital lawyers who make a lot of policy for doctors, they've made a lot of COVID policies, have been driven by hospital lawyers, general counsels of businesses. They tell you oftentimes... Don't talk to them at all. That's right. Don't talk to the patient. Don't talk to the family. We're going to quickly negotiate a settlement and we're going to gag everybody. In the settlement, so they rush to the family. Oftentimes before the family even thinks about a claim, they realize what happened. They rush to the families and say, you know, we feel for you and your family. They won't apologize. And we would like to 
provide some compensation. Here, just sign these documents, and then everyone's gagged for life. And we have not had an honest conversation about patient safety in America because of that. And that's why I wrote when I wrote the book, Unaccountable, about this issue of patient safety and how we can do better. I wrote in there that we should ban all gagging in medicine. This should be an honest profession, no gagging. Lorena and Eddie are incredibly successful, well off. She said out of the gate, we're not here to sue. There's no amount of money you can give us that's going to change our lives. We just want to make sure this never happens to anybody again. And that's an honest request. I mean, it's reasonable. If you look at other industries, they've achieved high levels of reliability. I'm too practical. I'm a clinician, as you are, so I don't subscribe to the zero harm approach. I mean, sure, it's, it might be a goal, but we have to be honest and look for reasonable improvements in this problem. But look at aviation. In the last 25 years, how many plane accidents have we seen? In 2009, there was the flight going to Buffalo where 50 people died. That's about it in the last 20 years. In 2018, there was a woman partially ejected through a window who died. But say in the interim nine years, 2009. In the U.S. In the U.S., in the nine years from 2009 to 2018, six billion passengers without a single fatality rate. Today, about two million people a day. Pilots are not just jumping in the cockpit and start barking orders at each other. They have a systematic way to use checklists and pathways and have safety nets. And they've created what they call crew resource management that encourages people as part of the discipline to voice any concern about safety and not to ridicule anyone who brings up that concern. That's a life lesson that can be used in any setting that you want people to ask questions and even challenge some deeply held assumptions you may have without ridiculing them. If you make fun of them once, I found, if you mock a nurse once or yell at them for bringing something up because you're busy, they will never feel as comfortable voicing a concern to you and your patients suffer. You suffer from that lack of safety culture. 